Welcome to our set of lectures revolving around the mitral valve anatomy and its stenosis. With this lecture here, we'll identify the components of the mitral valve and its supporting structures. We'll work through standard echocardiographic views a sonographer will employ to assess the valve appropriately. We'll also explore how transesophageal echo is utilised to assess the valve. The mitral valve is the only valve in the heart that has two leaflets. The annulus is slightly elliptical in shape, and viewed side on, it actually appears saddle shape. The anterior and posterior leaflets both have about the same surface area. However, the anterior leaflet holds a much smaller portion, much smaller portion of the annulus circumference. The posterior leaflet has three scallops or sails, a lateral, middle, and medial. These are also known as P1, P2, and P3. The anterior leaflet does not have the same definitive markers, but is roughly also labelled A1, A2, A3. So when we're reviewing from echo, uh, we pretty much have a mirror image of this. So this is the lateral side and this is the medial side. So this is more of actually a surgeon's uh, interpretation where they actually view the valve from above or basically from the other side. So we can see the posterior leaflet comes around, it takes around about two thirds of the annular size. While the anterior leaflet only takes about one third of the actual annulus. But we could see if we were actually to measure this out, the surface areas of the two leaflets would be around equivalent. So there are a lot of uh, support structures associated with the mitral valve. So the subvalvular apparatus plays an important role in the valve function. There are posteromedial and anterior papillary muscles. They form a tethering point for the cordae tendinae, which support the mitral valve. They ensure the valve closes insistently, but doesn't swing back like a set of barn doors. They're also important to note there are a number of different cordae. There are primary cordae, which run from the pinning muscle and insert into the leaflet. There are secondary cordae, which bifurcate from the primary cordae and run through the leaflet. There are commissural cordae, difficult to see in this one, which basically reach both anterior and posterior leaflets. And then there are also strut cordae that arise from the ventricular wall and then insert into the leaflet. There is also the aortic mitral annulus fibrosa. This is the area where the anterior leaflet the mitral valve inserts into the annulus and it also becomes the posterior aspect of the left ventricular outflow tract where it starts to become continuous with the aortic valve. So an assessment with our standard views, we like to start, of course, with a parasternal long axis view. We use the papillary muscles as a marker for obtaining the true LV cavity diameter. The ideal true LV diameter is obtained between the two papillary muscles. It is important when we're actually measuring LV cavity size that we try to avoid measuring strut cordae, particularly in the infralateral wall, and falsely make the posterior wall thicker than what it really is. The anterior leaflet has the greatest length and leaflet excursion and diastole. The posterior leaflet is shorter, but as we've mentioned, covers more of the annulus. Dual motion of the leaflets is seen in diastole for early diastolic filling, then a period of diastasis and then atrial contraction. Leaflets should open freely and point away from each other in diastole. When the leaflet closed, the coarptation might, might be followed by a slight motion of both leaflets towards the annulus, but not beyond. This is called systolic bowing of the leaflets. The sonographer must pan through the valve by tilting anteriorly and posteriorly to identify all three segments. Colour is also applied with the same tilting motion performed to identify any regurgitant lesions or stenosis. M mode shows a typical M pattern for the anterior leaflet and a mirrored W pattern for the posterior leaflet. As we've mentioned just earlier, the excursion of the anterior leaflet has, is much larger compared to the posterior leaflet. Changes seem as such as fluttering, single leaflet motion, and the coaptin line being thicker in systole, uh, indicate pathologies. While not a significant part of the common scan these days, MO has a, bent, a significant benefit in assessing timing events. It has very good temporal resolution. 
EPS or E-point septal separation was used to indicate LV dilatation. Basically, the greater the distance of the maximum excursion in early diastole, the E-point, and the basal septum, S, the greater the cavity size and the probability of systolic dysfunction. So here with our M mode, we have early diastolic filling, the period of diastasis, the atrial contraction, mirrored by the posterior leaflet, and the point of coarptation in systole. And here in our parasternal long axis window, we've got a left ventricle, and we can see the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflets clearly. The parasternal short axis view. The anterior and posterior leaflets are seen with a fish mouth like appearance in diastole. The commissure is not entirely horizontal and lies slightly oblique, laying at around about 2 o'clock and 8 o'clock positions. This view is best obtained by getting the aortic view in the parasternal short axis window and then tilting down and inferiorly. The sonographer must pan through the valve by tilting anteriorly to the left atrium and posteriorly down to see the chordae. Again, colour is applied and the same sweeping motion performed. And here we have a typical short axis view. So we can see the commissure line is slightly oblique anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet there. The apical four-chamber view. The anterior leaflet is seen to the left and the posterior leaflet is seen to the right of image. The anterolateral propelling muscle should be seen as this view attains the anterolateral LV wall. This view is an oblique cut through the valve. It does not run along the leaflet commissure. And it's important to note that this view is standard for measuring inflow profiles, pulse wave for diastolic function and stroke volume assessments, and continuous wave for forward flow intensity and stenosis evaluations are typically performed from this view. And so we have our apical four chamber view, a little bit hard to see, but anterior leaflet here, posterior leaflet there, and of course, as we mentioned, the anterolateral papillary muscle associated with this anterolateral wall. There are two apical two-chamber views. There's two, the true commissure review, where both the, the posterior medial and anterolateral papillary muscles are seen. The mitral valve takes on a tri-leaflet appearance. We can observe the medial portion of the posterior leaflet then the mid portion of the anterior leaflet, and then the lateral portion of the posterior leaflet again. This presentation is due to the crescenteric shape of the commissure, and the posterior leaflet dominating majority of the animal's circumference. The anterolateral papillary muscle is removed by rotating counterclockwise, and then we see an anterior leaflet on the right of the image and the posterior to the left. Again, this is an oblique view obtained through the mitral valve. So this two-chamber view here shows the inferior wall and the true anterior wall. And we can see that in this image here. So we can see both papillary muscles associated with the commissure view. We're actually moving straight through the commissure. And what we have here is the medial portion of the posterior leaflet, the mid portion of the anterior leaflet, and the lateral portion of the posterior leaflet. As we rotate around further, we lose the anterolateral pruning muscles. So this is the true anterior wall. And then this valve assumes that uh, typical two leaflet view again. So moving along, we come to the apical long axis view. This basically represents the peristernal long axis, but just rotated 90 degrees, so instead of the heart being vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal, it's now vertical in the image. The anterior leaflet is seen adjacent to the aortic valve, and the posterior is seen to the left of the image. So this view is best obtained by just simply rotating your probe further clockwise in the apical window. And so we can see it nice and clearly here. So we've got the posterior leaflet and then the anterior leaflet here. The subcostal view is also used to investigate for the mitral valve. We can get the subcostal four-chamber view, which is basically just like the apical four-chamber view with everything rotated to the side. So instead of the heart being vertical in the image, it is now laying across and more horizontal. 
with a little bit of careful orientation, we can actually get the subcostal short axis view, similar to the peristernal short axis view, but again with the view rotated around. This may be useful when there is particular anterior annular calcification, which prevents viewing the valve appropriately in the standard peristernal short axis window. Transesophageal windows are very good for obtaining information about the mitral valve. We use high frequencies which allow for greater spatial resolution. These are optimal for investigating for abscesses, infective endocarditis, and uh, excluding cardiac source of emboli, and also working up towards valve replacement. The anterior lift is seen at the bottom of the screen, viewing basically from the inside out. So views that mirror the apical long axis, apical 2 and apical 4 chamber are obtained. Transesophageal echo is very good in detailing the atrial aspect of the valve. If there's significant calcification, the ventricular aspect of the valve may be actually difficult to visualise. Moving the probe into a tangential position, the user can visualise the mitral valve from an LV long axis and short axis view. It is important to note that transesophageal imaging is limited by placement of the probe in the esophagus and contact with its wall. This is different to transthoracic echo, where the entire chest can actually be utilised, both front and back. Transesophageal echo is useful in confirming transthoracic findings, which provides a high detailed image of the valve. The study provides another opportunity to evaluate the mitral valve hemodynamics to provide confident calling with diagnostic information. The studies are often used to determine whether the valve is suitable for valvuloplasty or repair as alternatives to replacement. We can assess the severity of mitral regurgitation viewing from the atrial aspect of the valve, which is useful if there's significant calcification or prosthetic valves which distort the image from a transthoracic approach. This modality is best used to rule out thrombus in the left atrium and left ventricle, particularly in the left atrial appendage uh, in atrial fibrillation. This is a standard uh, view obtained before cardioversion. Basically, if there's anything sitting in the left atrial appendage and we apply a shock to the patient, the last thing we want to do is release anything from the appendage that can then go off into the systemic circulation, particularly going off to the brain and creating a stroke. The bright particular systolic pressure can be measured, which in turn allows us to evaluate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. A competent study will also assist for any other coexisting problems associated with the aortic, tricuspid or pulmonary valves. And here we have an assessment of the mitral valve. And note again, here we've got different rotations of the toe probe. So here this is more of a two-chamber view and this is a long axis view. Here we've got a short axis toe view, and we're actually looking at the left atrial appendage, and we can see it's actually filled up with a lot of spontaneous echo contrast. So a precursor to actually forming clot. So in summary, the mitral valve is a complex and interesting set of structures that is easily interrogated from both transthoracic and transesophageal echo. There are typical views that a sonographer will utilise to assess the valve and its supporting apparatus. The greater the complementive images acquired in the study, the more accurate we can be with our diagnostic calling.